Here's our title. We're ready to start part three of chapter 20, and we're going to start with some architecture. So um, this is where it is. This is the last part of the last chapter that we cover in this class. And there's not a lot of new material in this, this section. There'll be a lot of bonus features, though, because I want you to see some work that's being done by artists who are living now. Um, so we're going to start by looking at some architecture, and this is our first look at some a modern building that was built in the middle of the 20th century. So America really um, had a huge building boom following World War II, and many cities were developed at that time with a lot of skyscrapers in the current style, which is modern. And modern... Um, one aspect of modern is this sleek, no frills design that really is a descendant of that um, European style that we saw earlier. And so you can look at the neighborhood around the Seagram building and you see that there's just a bunch of big rectangular buildings. And this is why New York um, looks like this. It's got a little bit of variety now. There's some older buildings and some newer ones, but Charlotte, not at all, because um, Charlotte was developed much later when a different style was dominant. But this is uh, it. So the, these various rectangles, the thing that differs is the type of metal that was used, the shape and the color of the windows and the pattern of the windows, but basically they're all rectangular. And this was designed by uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Uh, he was uh, a person who was German and he left Nazi Germany and came to America and took some prestigious positions at American universities. And then he designed this with Philip Johnson. Um, he made it with bronze instead of standardized steel. So there, now you get a glimpse of it. We're just looking at one modern building. And then we're going to switch right into postmodern. So Postmodern obviously follows modern, just like post-impressionist followed impressionism. So postmodern architecture uses historical elements or quotes historical styles in a non-traditional way. We've seen some of this in the past, people um, using, say, classical elements in a non-classical way, um, but this is much different. So this is one of the very first postmodern buildings that was designed by Robert Venturi. And uh, I know you're looking at this and you're thinking, I don't get it. Well, it's kind of house shaped. The, the shape a child would draw a house with the pitched roof, sort of a rectangular bottom and then triangular pitched roof above. And then there's other things that simulate the traditional style like this form that could be a chimney but it's not a chimney and there's a use of an arch here but it's not used as an arch it's just sort of a decorative element so that kind of illustrates what postmodern architecture is about um, another aspect of postmodern architecture is deconstructivist. In fact, some, some people might say, well, it's completely different. It's not even postmodern. It's an attempt to disturb traditional architectural values of unity, harmony, and stability to convey a sense of dynam dynamism and energy. Um, these buildings may use distorted, skewed, or dynamic geometry to create structures which are not bound to traditional ideas of what buildings are. So I think that's a good way to think of deconstructivist architecture, that um, the buildings created in this very general style do not look like buildings. So English architect Norman Foster's Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank was created in the style of high tech. And this load-bearing skeleton is on the exterior, so meaning it's kind of like a big frame, a metal frame on the outside that is holding up the inside of the building. A rectangular floor plan features service towers at the east and west ends, eliminating the central service core of international style skyscrapers. And that was kind of the norm for a long time was to have the center section that was not exposed, not on the outside of the building, that would have the elevators and all of the, 
the um, shafts for electrical and plumbing, everything would run up through a service core, but it's on the outside now. And here's <clears throat> the most famous postmodern, uh, sorry, decon, decon architect practicing today, and this is Frank Gehry, and this is because his designs are really big and they're really bold and they're flashy and um, they're kind of exciting. So Frank Gehry developed an organic sculptural style exemplified in the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. The steel skeleton is draped with silvery titanium and resembles a giant ship when viewed from the north. So one of the aspects of the postmodern building that I just described was that it doesn't look like a building. So here we go. Here's an art museum that does not look like a building. Um, I had a student who told me where you enter the building because I was, was always thinking, well, it's obviously not a building because you don't see the door. The door is not obvious, but um, you enter in between these two big wings up here. And this will show up also on your quiz, you will have to know that it is an art museum. And this is another piece of art that is very evocative, I think. It's very emotional, but it's got content that also um, that creates this emotional response from people. And this is in the category of public memory. So public memorials can encapsulate a collective consciousness as well as appeal to emotional, personal response. Maya Ying Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial called for two 200-foot-long walls sunk into rising ground. It's like a disruptive gash representing the pain and disruption of the war and resulting death. It accommodates more than 58,000 names of deceased soldiers in the order in which they died. So many of you have been there because um, it's very common for students to go to Washington, D.C. on school trips. But um, these walls have the names of people. To me, one of the most effective things of this memorial was just the structure, how it just seems to cut through the ground like a big slice and interruption it it disrupts the beauty of that lawn with this horror of death so that's an emotional um, monument there and the devastating attacks on the world trade center and the pentagon escalated global tension we're still in that that post 9 11 period now most felt the World Trade Center site had to be rebuilt as a memorial, a symbol, and a functional group of buildings. Daniel Liebeskin's plan centered around a sunken field and memorial as well as a tower. So the people in New York spent a lot of time debating what should happen to the site. And uh, it took them a long time to come to a decision, but this is part of it. This was a design of a transportation hub by Santiago Calateva. And he designed this subway and train station at the site to handle 80,000 travelers a day. Its wings, these white things that you see here, were intended to open on the anniversary of the attack. He described the image as the hands of a child releasing a bird. And the bird, of course, is a symbol of peace. This is an architect's drawing, by the way. This is not a photograph of the finished building, but it has been built. It has been constructed. And some students have actually been there. This is a photograph of the interior that was taken at Christmas time. So it's a very different, very beautiful um, and lyrical, I think, form of a building that's kind of like a decon building. It doesn't really look like a building. And here's a a photograph today of the One World Trade Center with the new tower of the building in the center in Manhattan, New York. Now, this is where the bonus features begin. So you can just uh, relax or flip past them. I think they're kind of fun. But several contemporary postmodern artists make reference to art of the past. And I show you these because you saw the original. So there's um, a take on the Raft of the Medusa by Jericho, a photograph of a bunch of, I don't know, I'm going to say drunk people on a raft. Um, 
very similar. This one I really like, Rigo versus uh, Bernard Pras. So we saw the um, Iacinth Rigo portrait of Louis XIV on the left. And this artist, Bernard Pra, um, duplicated that out of objects that he bought at a dollar store. So I love it how um, the, the ermine cape has become a bunch of toilet paper. There's lots of candy and snacks in there too. So that's kind of fun, an assemblage. The artwork, I believe, is the photograph and not the actual stuff. Vic Muniz is a Brazilian artist who copies old master paintings in junkyards. So you can see on the painting on the left, um, it, if you can look at it, he arranges the actual trash to create these images. And then he has a huge crane and a camera on top. That's Vic Muniz. And then Kehinde Wiley is an American. He's living today. And um, he's very interesting. The, I believe the film about him is, on, is in Unit 20. This is usually the subject that we discuss on the last day of class. So I will have discussion questions up about uh, Kehinde Wiley and his film. So make sure that you get that watched before class next week, class time. And he's, um, he loves to take old master paintings and reimagine them with African-American people in these, the places of these white people in the painting. So it's great. I hope you like that. Here's a couple of Kehinde Wileys that are actually in North Carolina in the North Carolina Museum of Art. Other contemporary artists adopt a new type of iconoclasm by subverting symbols and subjects loaded with meaning in a deliberately provocative way. So Leonardo da Vinci um, got co-opted by Jeff Koons, who's a, a neo-pop artist, you'll see. So here's Jeff Koons. He is very rich, and he takes a lot of stuff from pop culture, like... Um, Pink Panther, Michael Jackson, um, balloon animals. And he also does not do the work himself. He has a team of people who make it for him. So it's kind of controversial. Banksy, a graffiti artist. A lot of students are familiar with his work. And I like the fact that he took Jeff Koons' balloon dog and used it. Sonia Clark, Unraveling and Unraveled. So this might uh, touch a nerve with some of you, but she's an African-American artist who took issue with the use of the Confederate battle flag. And there's also, that's a link to a film. Um, but I think it's very powerful. She was pulling the threads out of this flag and sort of saying, you know, enough, let's, let's just take it apart. And then this one is uh, just a group of red, white, and blue threads. And then there's just several images here that were in the introductory chapter of the book, and I didn't really talk about them at any other point, but I thought you might like to see a photograph of Imogen Cunningham, Georgia O'Keeffe, another flower painting, I've already seen her. Um, I think a really provocative sculpture here of a couple of uh, people that look dead. It's just, to me, it's very uh, dehumanizing and kind of grim. But this is Kiki Smith. And let's see here, 1990 with that. Alice Neal's self-portrait. This was also discussed in the introductory chapter. Now, you get your Poll Everywhere questions. There you go, the end.